In this fourth video, I'm going to acquaint you with the eight basic rules of logical inference. Before I do that, though, I just want to return to the truth table discussion we had earlier and explain how the conditional and the biconditional fit into the truth table characterization. So we've got four different possible worlds. The four different ways it could be as far as two sentences go. They're both true. First one true, second one false. First one false, second one true. And then they're both false. Completely straightforward when it comes to the negation. In the two instances where the negation is true, or sorry, the sentence P is true, tilde P is false. In the two instances where, tilde, where P is false, tilde P is true. If I could just get that out straightforwardly, the relation between the truth table characterization and the tilde completely unproblematic. The same holds with the two binary connectives uh, conjunction and disjunction. The conjunction, it's true in the possible world where both conjuncts are true, otherwise it's false. The inclusive disjunction, one or the other or both, is true in every possible world except the fourth one where they're both false. All of that is straightforward, highly intuitive. As a result, there's no controversy regarding the claim that the tilde, the ampersand, and the val are all purely what are called truth functional connectives. That just means you can always tell the truth or falsity of a negation, a conjunction, or a disjunction as long as you know the truth or falsity of its constituent parts. What we're going to see now, though, is that the horseshoe and the triple bar, that is to say the conditional and the biconditional, are not purely truth functional connectives. To illustrate this, I've just got four simple sentences Capital J stands for Justin Trudeau is the Prime Minister of Canada in 2020. Capital W stands for Wayne is teaching philosophy 1150 in summer 2020. Capital S, you are in Surrey, the Surrey where Kwantlen is, of course. Capital C, you are in Canada. Let's consider the first situation, possible world one, where both the antecedent and the consequent of a conditional are true. If capital S is the antecedent, you are in Surrey, which is true. If capital C is the consequent, you are in Canada, then it makes perfect sense to claim that the conditional, if you're in Surrey, then you're in Canada, is also true. Notice, though, there are a range of other situations where the truth or falsity of the conditional in the situation where both the antecedent and the consequent are true is a lot less intuitive. Suppose we've got another conditional where C, you're in Canada, is the antecedent. S, you're in Surrey, is the consequent. Those are both true. Does that mean that the conditional is true, as it did in the situation, if you're in Surrey, then you're in Canada? Answer, no. It's pretty clear that it's false if you're in Surrey, you're in Canada. You might 
or sorry, if you're in Canada, then you're in Surrey. You might happen to be in Surrey, but there's lots of places you can be where you're in Canada and you're not in Surrey. On the other hand, though, in order for it to be a situation where both the antecedent and the consequent are true, it would have to be a situation where you happen to be in Surrey, though. So imagine possible world one. You are in Surrey, which is in Canada, of course. So the antecedent, you're in Canada, is true. The consequent, you're in Surrey, is also true. Here's the question, though. Does that force us to the conclusion that the sentence, if you're in Canada, then you're in Surrey, must also be true? Answer, no. That sentence is false, even though it's clearly a situation where both the antecedent and the consequent are true. Here's another situation. Suppose we have the conditional J horseshoe W. These are both true. Justin is the Prime Minister of Canada in 2020. Wayne is teaching philosophy 1150 in summer 2020. Does that mean that the conditional, if Justin is the Prime Minister of Canada in 2020, then Wayne is teaching philosophy 1150 in summer 2020? A situation like this, it's difficult to tell. Again, it's crystal clear that both the antecedent and the consequent of the conditional are true, but, and here's the problem, there's no relation between the antecedent being true and the consequent being true. These are two unconnected claims. With conditionals, we understand that there's got to be some connection between the antecedent being true and the consequent being true or false in order for a conditional containing them to be true or false. So the best we can do is put a question mark here. It's just not clear what the situation is where both the antecedent and the consequent of a conditional are true. Just to emphasize the contrast, nothing like that ever occurs with the negation, with the conjunction, or the disjunction. The second possible world, where the antecedent is true and the consequent is false, that's the one situation where the truth or falsity of the conditional is indeed straightforward. If the antecedent is true and the consequent is false, then the conditional has got to be false. So, for example, if you weren't in Surrey, that would be a situation where the statement, let's say you were in Langley, the claim you were in Canada would be true, the claim you're in Surrey would be false, and the fact that you're in Langley is a clear, concrete demonstration that the conditional, if you're in Canada, then you're in Surrey, must be false, because you're in Canada, but you're in Langley. So that particular one is pretty clear. Now, when we get to the two situations where the antecedent is false, things get even stranger as far as the conditional goes. Imagine a situation where the antecedent of a conditional is false and the consequent of a conditional is true. If the moon is made of green cheese, which is false, then Wayne is teaching philosophy 1150 in summer 2020. That's a very strange conditional. It's difficult to really know what to make of it. Do we want to say it's true? Do we want to say it's false? 
The complete lack of connection between the antecedent and the consequent place us in a very odd situation. Things are even stranger when they're both false. If the moon is made of green cheese, then you're teaching philosophy 1120, or sorry, philosophy 1150 in summer 2020. What do we make of a conditional like that? Both the antecedent and the consequent are false. Do we want to say it's false? Do we want to say it's true? The conditional, except for the one instance where the antecedent is true and the consequent is false, it's very difficult to make any intuitive assignment of the truth value, which just means the truth or falsity, of the compound statement, the conditional, based on the truth or falsity of its two constituent parts, very unlike the negation, the conjunction, and the disjunction. Since the biconditional is really just a conjunction of two conditionals, a somewhat parallel situation also arises here. When One of the two bicons is true and the other one is false. That would be a situation where one of the two mirror imaged conditionals that make up a biconditional would have to be false. Therefore, the conjunction of the two mirror imaged conditionals would have to be false. So, when the two bicons connected by the triple bar have different truth values, one, the first one's true and the second one's false, or the first one's false and the second one's true, straightforwardly the biconditional is false. But in the two situations where they're both false or they're both true, very difficult with any certainty to determine whether the biconditional is true or false. So the moral of the story then is that the truth tables are kind of a handy way of illustrating the logical implications of negations, conjunctions, and disjunctions. But when it comes to conditionals and biconditionals, the truth tables are no longer handy ways of illustrating the logical implications of those compound sentences. That being said, I'll now provide for you the official truth and falsity specifications. Well, actually, remember this situation where the antecedent is true and the consequent is false. That one's clear enough, and in the biconditional, those two are both true. So these continue to hold. Here are the official truth table specifications for the conditional. And for the biconditional. So notice what we have then. In a situation where the antecedent is false and the consequent is false, the conditional is treated as true. In other words, if the moon was made of green cheese, you'd be teaching philosophy 1150 this summer. Since those are both, fa both false, the conditional is true. An understandable reaction, that's just odd. What reason would there be for counting that conditional to be true? The answer is because we know that certain simple arguments are clearly valid or invalid. Do you remember what that means? An argument is valid whenever it's impossible for all the premises to be true and the conclusion false. Another way of putting it is to say, when an argument is valid, the truth of the premises makes the truth of the conclusion necessary. 
And it's because we know that certain inference patterns are valid, that's how these truth table determinations are made in the case of the conditional and the biconditional. So except for the three falsity ones, all of those true ones are assigned not on the basis of our understanding the implications of the sentence itself and what it means in isolation, but rather because we understand that certain quite simple inferences, and we'll be seeing examples of these in a few minutes, are valid or invalid. So last thing to say before we leave off the truth table, as far as the negation, conjunction, and disjunction, there's some plausibility in claiming that we can use truth tables to demonstrate the validity or invalidity of arguments containing some combination of negations, conjunctions, and disjunctions. As soon as conditionals or biconditionals enter the picture, however, we can no longer use truth tables to demonstrate validity or invalidity involving arguments containing these compound sentences because the very truth table assignments are based on our already knowing the validity or invalidity of arguments containing those components. That's the abstract discussion. Now we'll move on to consider a couple of simple concrete examples of this phenomenon. We're going to leave truth tables to the side for the time being, however. I'd like you to consider the following four argument forms. These are four very short, simple little arguments that are pretty similar. So it's important that we notice the similarities and the differences between them. So I would suggest draw a square in the top half of an eight and a half by 11 piece of paper. So I've got four quadrants here, each of which contains a simple little argument consisting of a conditional, and then the second premise in the little two premise arguments is unique for each of them. So this one in the top left hand corner is a conditional and its antecedent, and from that, you infer the consequent. This one here is a conditional and its consequent. From that, we infer the antecedent. This one is a conditional and the negation of its antecedent. From that, we infer the negation of the consequent. And finally, this one is a conditional and the negation of the consequent. From that, we infer the negation of the antecedent. Before we consider the, this argument in the top left in a little more detail, notice that with these four arguments, I've characterized them in terms of lowercase letters. Here's the purpose for characterizing each of these four arguments in lowercase letters. In sentential logic, uppercase letters are used to indicate simple sentences. Lowercase letters, though, are used to indicate variables. So, here's an example again of the one in the top left. We've got a conditional, and we've got the antecedent of that conditional then a horizontal line separating the two premises from the conclusion which is the consequent of that conditional. Now, this template with the lowercase letters represents 
Every argument you can have in the actual symbolic language that has the same form or underlying logical structure. So here's the simplest case scenario. A horseshoe B, A, on the basis of those two, you infer B. We could have a slightly more complicated version, though, where we've got if K or H, then tilde M, K or H, from that you infer tilde M. We could go even more complicated. C if, C if and only if tilde D, then J and R. C if and only if tilde D, from that you infer J and R. So the idea is this little template with the lowercase letters stands for every possible argument in the symbolic language where you've got a conditional and the exact antecedent of that conditional and on the basis of those two things you infer the exact consequent of that conditional. All of these different arguments have the same underlying logical structure or logical form. So that's what's represented by the lowercase letters here. And it's worth representing because the idea is since these three arguments have the same underlying logical structure, all three of them are either valid or invalid because all three arguments have the same logical structure, the same form. So, now we can consider, is this form of argumentation a valid one? where you have a conditional and its antecedent, and from that you infer the consequent. Well, here's one way of considering this question. Remember what it means for an argument or inference pattern to be valid. It's impossible for all two of the premises above the line to be true and the conclusion false. Could you think of an example where all two of the premises are true, that is to say, some conditional and its antecedent, but the consequent of that same conditional is false at the same time. Another way of looking at it is to think in terms of what the two statements say about how the world is. The conditional says the world is such that if P is true, then Q's got to be true. So having a claim about the world, if P is true, then Q's got to be true, in combination with this second claim, and P is true, it's simply not possible for Q not to be true. If Q is not true, then either the claim that if P is true, then Q's got to be true must be false, or the claim that P is true has to be false, or both of them, of course. There's just no way for these two sentences to be true and the sentence below the line to be false. This argument is simple enough so that by thinking carefully about the implications about the world that are indicated by the two premises, we can realize that if the two premises are true, or whenever the two premises are true, it's impossible for the conclusion or inferred sentence below the line to be false. So, put a little V in this or corner to indicate that this little argument is valid. In fact, 
This pattern of argumentation is a very familiar one in Western society, and it's been known to be a valid or logically flawless way to reason for centuries. Since it's been known to be a valid form of argument for so long, it actually has a Latin name. This little pattern of reasoning where you infer the consequent of a conditional on the basis of the conditional itself and its antecedent is called modus ponens. And the abbreviation, which is just the first two letters of those two words, MP will be useful when we want to refer to this specific pattern of argument or pattern of reasoning. All right, now let's move to this second pattern of reasoning, which is similar to modus ponens. We've got the conditional, but it's different in the following way. Instead of on the basis of the conditional and its antecedent, we infer the consequent, with this one, on the basis of the conditional and its consequent, we infer the antecedent. Here's a concrete example of this. If my hypothesis is true, then the litmus paper will turn blue. We run the experiment. The litmus paper did turn blue. Therefore, my hypothesis is correct. Is that a valid way to reason? It seems like it might be, but in fact, it's not. Can I prove that it isn't? Yes, I can. I can prove that it isn't by producing what's called a counter example. A counterexample is a concrete situation where the two premises are true and the conclusion is false. If I can produce a concrete description of a coherent situation where all two of the premises are true, but the conclusion or inferred sentence below the line is false, that just is a demonstration that this pattern of reasoning is invalid. How about the following? If you're in Kelowna, then you're in British Columbia. True is a matter of geographical fact. You are in British Columbia. That's true for almost all of us. So imagine the situation of someone in Surrey. It's true, even if you're in Surrey, that if you're in Kelowna, then you're in British Columbia. It's also true that you're in British Columbia, but it's false that you're in Kelowna. Because we're supposing you're in Surrey. If you're in any other place besides Kelowna, in British Columbia, then it'll be true that if you're in Kelowna, you're in British Columbia, because that's true as a matter of geographical fact. It's also true that you're in British Columbia, but it's false that you're in Kelowna. So that's an example of a flawed pattern of reasoning. Even if you've got all your facts straight, you can still come up with a false conclusion. The falsity of the conclusion is compatible with your having all your information straight. That's yet another way of describing what it means for an argument to be logically flawed or invalid. This particular flawed pattern of argumentation is called
affirming the consequent. Let's now move to the pattern of reasoning in the bottom left hand side here. So we've got that same conditional P horseshoe Q, but along with the conditional we've got the negation of P and from that we're inferring the negation of Q, the consequent. Is that a valid or invalid pattern of reasoning? Again, the question is, can we think of a counterexample? That is, can you coherently describe a concrete situation where these two premises are true? A conditional is true and its antecedent is false. And at the same time, though, the negation of the consequent is false. So another way of putting it is, can you describe a situation where the conditional is true, antecedent is false, but the consequent is true? Because the negation of the consequent being false is equivalent to the consequent being true. The geographical examples are always the way to go here, I think. If you're in Alberta, or sorry, how about this one? If you're in Calgary, then you're in Alberta. That's also true as a matter of geographical fact, because Calgary is in Alberta. If you're in Calgary, then you're in Alberta. We're not in Calgary. Therefore, we're not in Alberta. Oh, that's not a counterexample. Because I've described a situation where the two premises are true, but it turned out the conclusion tilde G, or sorry, tilde Q, is also true. Maybe it is valid. Maybe we need to think a little more carefully. Pause the video. Can you think of a concrete situation where all two of these premises are true and the conclusion is false? Has anyone thought of one? How about if we go back to the same counterexample strategy we used for affirming the consequent? So the conditional then will be, if you're in Kelowna, then you're in British Columbia. Let's suppose we're in Surrey or somewhere in the Lower Mainland. Then, as a matter of geographical fact, it's true that if you're in Kelowna, you're in British Columbia. It's also true that you're not in Kelowna, but it's false that you're not in British Columbia. So that's a counterexample. That is to say, there's a situation conclusively demonstrating that it's possible for all two premises to be true and the conclusion false. So that makes this pattern of argument invalid. This is the thing about invalid patterns of argument, though. There can be a number of different situations where all of the premises are true and the conclusion happens to be true as well. That doesn't automatically make it a logically flawless argument. You can be arguing for the correct or right conclusion using bad reasoning. So, what we want to know is, is it or is it not possible for all the premises to be true, all two of them, and the conclusion false? In the case of this pattern of argumentation, it is possible, and that conclusively demonstrates that this is a flawed pattern of reasoning. Since the second premise in this pattern of reasoning is 
The antecedent of the conditional with the tilde in front of it, the negation or denial of the antecedent, this pattern of reasoning is called denying the antecedent. Here is a logical test for you. If this pattern of reasoning is called denying the antecedent, because along with the common conditional, the second premise is the negation or denial of the antecedent, and this pattern is called affirming the consequent, because the second premise is the stating or affirming of the consequent of the conditional, what is a more modern name for the pattern that's traditionally been called modus ponens. Answer, affirming the antecedent. Finally, we can proceed to the last pattern of reasoning. Here we've got the common conditional along with the negation or denial of the consequent. So, this pattern of reasoning can be called denying the consequent. Once again, in order to make a determination regarding whether denying the consequent is a valid or invalid pattern of reasoning, what we want to know, is it or is it not possible to describe a counterexample? That is to say, a concrete situation where all two premises are true and the conclusion is false. How about, if you're in Kelowna, then you're in British Columbia, true. Second premise, we're not in British Columbia. Oh, that's false. So that one's not going to work as a counterexample. What about, if you're in Calgary, then you're in Alberta. We're not in Alberta. Okay, so that's a situation where the two premises are true. What's the conclusion? You're not in Calgary. Oh, that's true as well. So that's not a counterexample. We need to think of a situation, if we can, where all two of those premises are true and the conclusion is false. After six hours, we cannot find one, and the reason we cannot find one is that this pattern of reasoning, like modus ponens, is a valid pattern of reasoning. It's not possible for a conditional and its antecedent to be true and the consequent of that conditional to be false. It's also not possible for a conditional to be true and its, ante sorry, its consequent to be false while at the same time the antecedent is true. Whenever a conditional is true and the consequent is false, the antecedent has to also be false. This pattern of reasoning, not a big surprise I hope, like modus ponens, has also been known to be a valid pattern of reasoning for many centuries, and like modus ponens, it has a Latin name which is close to a rhyme to modus ponens, but not quite. This pattern of reasoning is traditionally called modus tollens. So we've got modus ponens, modus tollens. Kind of a half rhyme similarity, but not a full rhyme. The abbreviation for modus tollens is MT. Notice, affirming the consequent 
has no abbreviation, denying the antecedent has no abbreviation, because those are flawed patterns of reasoning, and we don't want to be using them in order to analyze the logical structure of arguments. We only want to use simple patterns of inference or patterns of reasoning that are valid. One other thing to note, some logic textbooks have tried to modernize the terminology, but for whatever reason, affirming the antecedent and denying the consequent have never really caught on as modernized names for modus ponens and modus tollens. Since we want to be as effective as possible in communicating our insights about logic to other people, so modus tollens is also valid, we're going to use the more commonly used Latin terms for these two argument patterns. So conditional and antecedent, from that you infer consequent, that's modus ponens. Conditional and negation of consequent, from that you infer negation of antecedent, that's modus tollens. These two patterns of inference are valid. If you disagree, I invite you to present a counterexample, but remember it's got to be a situation where both of the sentences above the line are true and the one below the line is false. These two, denying the antecedent and affirming the consequent, are invalid or logically flawed patterns of reasoning. Before I erase them, I just want you to note, though, that these four little patterns of reasoning are pretty similar. You have to be looking at them carefully, noticing details, because when it comes to issues of logical form or underlying logical structure, details become really important. So, very important to know the difference between modus ponens and modus tollens, which are valid or logically flawless patterns of reasoning, and affirming the consequent and denying the antecedent, which are very similar to the two valid patterns of reasoning, but are in fact invalid or logically flawed. So, P, horseshoe, Q, and P. Any conditional and the exact antecedent of that conditional, from that you infer the exact consequent. That pattern of reasoning is called modus ponens, and you can never go logically wrong with it. That's a valid pattern of reasoning. The abbreviation for modus ponens is MP. The second valid one, a conditional and the negation of the consequent, from that you infer the negation of the antecedent. This little pattern of reasoning is also logically flawless. You can never go wrong reasoning in this way. So these two little patterns of reasoning are logically flawless, and they're going to play an important part in our strategic logical analysis of argument forms. So these two argument forms, modus ponens and modus tollens, are the first two of the basic eight patterns of inference, or forms of argument. A third pattern of argument, or form of inference, that also contains a conditional, is the following one. With this one, in addition to a conditional, 
we're going to have another conditional, but notice the two conditionals are related in a very specific way. So we've got two conditionals, P horseshoe Q and Q horseshoe R. The relation between them is that the consequent of one of them is identical to the antecedent of the other one. So we've got a unique antecedent, a unique consequent, and then we've got the consequent identical to the antecedent of the other. I want to emphasize that this is the order in the template, but there's no necessity that the two sentences come in this exact order. So you could also have Q horseshoe R P horseshoe Q. The important thing, whatever order they happen to come in, the important thing about this third pattern of inference is you have two conditionals where the antecedent of one, the consequent of the other, are identical. What Further sentence has to be true whenever these two related conditionals are true. Well, here's a concrete example to illustrate. If you're in Vancouver, then you're in British Columbia. If you're in British Columbia, then you're in Canada. Therefore, if you're in Vancouver, then you're in Canada. So, anytime these two related conditionals are true, a third conditional consisting of the unique antecedent and the unique consequent has to also be true. Think about the implications. If it is indeed true that if you're in Vancouver, then you're in British Columbia, and it's also true that if you're in British Columbia, then you're in Canada, how could it not also be true that if you're in Vancouver, then you're in Canada? So this simple pattern of inference is also valid, logically flawless. This third pattern of inference is called hypothetical syllogism. And its abbreviation, like modus ponens and modus tollens, is just the first two letters of the two words. The reason this particular pattern of argument is called hypothetical syllogism is, first of all, because it consists of inferring a third conditional from two conditionals that are related to each other in a very specific way. And the name comes from Britain, where instead of calling compound sentences containing a horseshoe conditionals, as we do in North America, they call them hypotheticals. The second word, syllogism, it's one of these words that has a number of technical meanings, but here, what's important is just its basic meaning, simple little argument. So, this is the simple little argument containing conditionals. From two specifically related conditionals, we can always validly infer a third conditional. But very important, it can't be two conditionals with identical antecedents or two conditionals with identical consequence. It has to be two conditionals where the consequent of one is identical to the antecedent of the other, or, if you like, the antecedent of one is identical to the consequent of the other. So these are the first three of our eight 
basic logical rules. Very simple patterns of reasoning, but the important thing about these three simple patterns of reasoning is that they are unquestionably valid, which is to say, if the sentences above the horizontal line are true, it's impossible for the sentence below the horizontal line to be false. Modus ponens, modus tollens, and hypothetical syllogism, then, are the first three of the eight basic rules we're going to start doing proofs with after the first exam. At this point, we can just think of all eight of the basic rules as very simple, obviously valid, unquestionably valid, logical building blocks. So we've got three horseshoe basic rules. Now we're going to move on to the two ampersand basic rules. The two ampersand basic rules are so obviously valid it'll seem like a waste of time even considering them. Here's the situation. These two argument forms are so obviously valid that you're just not going to see them in isolation. But all eight of the rules, the value for us with these rules is going to come when we begin to chain them together into longer series of inferences, each individual one of which is unquestionably valid. So the fact that these two ampersand rules are so obviously valid, it might seem like a waste of time considering them in isolation. When we start constructing proofs, we will see that their value comes in the proof construction process, which will have to wait until after the first exam. The first ampersand rule starts off with a conjunction. Notice we've got the lowercase letters P and Q, so that could be any conjunction. What could be more obviously valid than this? If a particular conjunction is true, and remember, the only way a conjunction can be true is if both conjuncts are true. If a particular conjunction is true, then we can always safely infer the left conjunct from that conjunction, or the right conjunct. As I said, this is so obviously valid, you're not going to see this obviously valid inference pattern being explained to people in isolation. But as far as we're concerned, the important thing isn't that it's subtle, complicated, or illuminating, but that it's unquestionably valid. That is to say, if the sentence above the line is true, it is impossible for the inferred sentence below the line to be false, which it is in this case. This particular rule is called simplification because we are simplifying the conjunction when we remove one or the other of its conjuncts. The abbreviation for simplification isn't just capital S. There are other rules that start with S. So it's SIMP. Capital S I M P. The second 
ampersand rule is is obviously valid. With this rule, we start off with any two sentences, and from those two sentences, we can always validly infer a conjunction of them. Once again, hopefully you're thinking, well, duh, if these two are true, how could the conjunction of them not also be true? This is what we want, though. Obviously valid, not earth-shattering and, and insightful, but obviously valid. So this one is called conjunction because we are taking two sentences and pasting them together into a conjunction. The abbreviation C-O-N-J. So that's modus ponens, modus tollens, hypothetical syllogism, simplification and conjunction. That's five of the eight basic rules. The next two are the two Vell rules. The first one is like this. From any disjunction, the claim that at least one of these two is true, possibly both, but at least one, along with a second claim that it ain't the right one, or sorry, it ain't the left one, or it ain't the right one, we can always validly infer the other disjunct. It's not possible for these two sentences to be true and this sentence be false. If the disjunction is true, then at least one of P or Q is true. If the second sentence is true, then P isn't true, so Q has to be true. Otherwise, the disjunction is false, and we're assuming that these two sentences are true. The same considerations hold over here. So this is an obviously, unquestionably valid, simple inference pattern. This one's called disjunctive syllogism. The second disjunction rule, I'll tell you in advance, it's valid all right, but it's an odd inference to make. It's going to seem strange. Some people mistakenly think it must be invalid. It's not invalid, but it certainly is strange in isolation. With this second rule, just put a little partition here, from any sentence, it's always valid to infer a disjunction where the sentence you started off with is either the left or the right disjunct of that disjunction. So, concrete example. Wayne is in the room, therefore, Wayne is in the room, or Bill Gates is in the room. Possibly both. That's just a weird argument to make in isolation. The reason it strikes you as weird is that in this argumentative pattern, this pattern of reasoning, what we're doing is starting off with a specific bit of known information. So with the left one here, 
knowing that P is true, and from that we're inferring a vaguer bit of information, namely at least one of P or Q is true. And in general, it's not useful to reason on the basis of specific information to vaguer information. So think about this. If P is true, then you know something very definite about the world. A particular simple sentence is true. If the disjunction P or Q is true, though, leaving to the side the fact that the disjunction P or Q was inferred from P, just focusing on the disjunction P or Q alone, you don't know whether P is Q, or sorry, you don't know whether P, the left disjunct, is true. You don't know whether Q, the right disjunct, is true. All you know with the disjunction is they aren't both false. If a disjunction is true, then the right disjunct is true and the left one false, or the left disjunct is true and the right one false, or they're both true. A much vaguer or weaker commitment about how the world is with the disjunction than with the simple sentence. On the other hand, clearly valid, right? If the sentence P is true, how could it not be that at least one of P or Q is true? You already know that P is true, so at least one of P or Q has to be true. You can never go from P being true to P or Q being false, because the only way for P or Q to be false is for both P and Q to be false. Again, you're never going to see this argument in isolation. After the first test, though, we will see that this particular admittedly odd pattern of inference has a couple of very distinctive uses, and like all of the other rules, the main question, is it unquestionably valid? That is to say, if the sentence you start off with above the line is true, is it impossible for the sentence below the line to be false? Yes, it is. So this particular pattern of inference is called addition because you're adding a disjunct to the sentence you started off with and the abbreviation not just capital A but ADD. So that's three horseshoe rules two ampersand rules, two vel rules, that's seven. So what's the eighth rule? Is it a tilde rule or a triple bar rule? No, it isn't. It's a sort of combination. We could call it The Val Horseshoe Rule. So the Val Horseshoe Rule, like all of the rules in the Eight Basic Rules, is unquestionably valid, but unlike the other ones, it's not obviously so. So we might have to think about the Val Horseshoe Rule a little bit in order to satisfy ourselves that it is indeed valid. So the Val Horseshoe Rule looks like this. Maybe I'll just invite you to consider what 
sentence must also be true if a disjunction P or Q is true, as well as two conditionals, P horseshoe R, Q horseshoe S. You may not have noticed it, but these three sentences are related in the following way. We've got a disjunction, then we have two conditionals where the antecedents of the two conditionals are the two disjuncts in the disjunction. So we have to have three sentences that are related to each other in a very specific way. If those three sentences are true, the following sentence must also be true. A disjunction of the two consequence. Here's a simple example. You can take Philosophy 1150 at the Surrey campus or at the Langley campus, or both. If you take it at the Surrey campus, you'll be taking it from Fenske. If you take it at the Langley campus, you'll be taking it from Findler. Therefore, you can take logic from Fenske or Findler. There's an example of this pattern of reasoning. Here's another one. You can get from the Surrey campus to the Langley campus by going down 64th Avenue or by going down Highway 10. Two different roads. Or both, you could transverse back and forth and use both of the roads. If you go down 64th, it'll take you half an hour. If you go down Highway 10, it'll take you 20 minutes. Therefore, it'll take you half an hour or 20 minutes. This particular argument might be, might be given to someone who has a car and is worried whether they can get from the Surrey campus to the Langley campus within an hour. A response might be, you can get to the Langley campus taking 64th, or you can get to the Langley campus taking Highway 10. If you take 64th, it'll take you half an hour. If you take Highway 10, it'll take you 20 minutes. Therefore, relax. You can get there in half an hour or 20 minutes. So you might, as I said, you might have to think about this one a little bit. It's valid, all right. It's impossible for the, these three sentences to be true and the sentence below the line to be false but it's not as obviously valid as the other ones. So this particular rule of inference is called constructive dilemma. And the reason it's called that is the disjunction presents us with a dilemma, so to speak. We can follow the one alternative or the other one. If we follow the first alternative, that's going to bring about R. If we follow the second alternative, that's going to bring about S. Since we're going to be following at least one of these alternatives, the result is going to be R or S. Constructive dilemma, and the abbreviation for this one is just the first two letters, CD. So there we have it, our eight basic rules of inference. The three horseshoe rules, modus ponens, modus tollens, hypothetical syllogism. The two ampersand rules, simplification and conjunction. The two vel rules, disjunctive syllogism and addition. And At this point, we will have a little on-video exercise. So what I'd like you to do first is, on a sheet of paper, write out the patterns, the names, and the abbreviations for each of the eight basic rules. The way the eight basic rules work is that as long as you have 
all of the information above the horizontal line in any order, so it doesn't necessarily have to be in the exact order that it is in the rule template. If you have all of that information, then you are entitled to validly infer the sentence below the line. The other thing to notice, of course, is that these rules don't only apply to their forms containing simple sentences. As long as the same sentence goes in all occurrences of P, Q, R, let's say, in the rule template, that's an example of a situation that is an example, a concrete example, in the symbolic language SL of the rule. So, in just 30 seconds, pause the video, make sure that you have all eight of the basic rules, their names, and their abbreviations. Then I'd like you to do these 13 questions and what I want you to do is put down the name of the rule and the abbreviation for that rule that's illustrated in each of these instances. I might also point out, I haven't made the test yet, but approximately 20% of the test will be questions like this. <clears throat> there will probably be 10 questions like this on the test, and for each of those 10 questions, you need to correctly name the rule employed in the symbolic inference, where you're inferring the sentence below the horizontal line from the one, two, or three sentences above the horizontal line, as well as the abbreviation. So pause the video now, write out your rule sheet for the basic eight rules, then complete the 13 questions where you identify the name of the rule and the abbreviation for that rule. Then we'll go through each of these together. So, let's see how we did. In the first question, we have, above the horizontal line, a conjunction of two disjunctions, and from that we infer a disjunction, namely the disjunction which is the left conjunct. So that's an example of Simplification, and the abbreviation for that is SIMP. In the second question, we have a conditional, and from that, we've inferred a disjunction of two conditionals, one of which is the conditional we started off with. So that's an example of addition, the abbreviation ADD. In the third one, we have two sentences. We've got a conditional and a sentence with two tildes in front of it. Do you recall me saying the rules for the tilde are that Every tilde applies to the first full sentence immediately to the right of it. So this innermost tilde in the second of our premises, so to speak, refers to the conjunction in brackets and 
This outermost tail there refers to the negated conjunction in brackets. So what we've got here then is a conditional and the second sentence is the consequent of that conditional with a tilde in front of it. From that we've inferred the antecedent of the conditional with a tilde in front of it. That is Modus tollens, the abbreviation MT. In the fourth question, we've got a triple disjunction, but notice that the first two disjuncts are put together with square brackets. So this disjunction of two conjunctions is one of the disjuncts in this disjunction. What's the name of this vowel? That's called the main connective, right? That's the kind of sentence this whole thing is. The other disjunct is the biconditional S if and only if T. It's got brackets around it because it's in this larger disjunction. Our second bit of information is the negation of the right disjunct. And from that, we infer a disjunction of these two conjunctions. Notice when these, this disjunction of these two conjunctions is on its own without this other stuff, it no longer needs the square brackets. That is... disjunctive syllogism, the abbreviation DS. In the fifth example, we have two conditionals. From that, we infer the conjunction of those two conditionals. That's an example of the rule conjunction, the abbreviation is conj. Question six. Here we've got Two conditionals. The important thing to notice, these two conditionals are related in a specific way. The consequent of the top one, identical to the antecedent of the bottom one. If those two conditionals are true, then this third conditional, sorry, with the unique antecedent and the unique consequent, which is itself a smaller conditional, must also be true. That is hypothetical syllogism, the abbreviation HS. The seventh one a lot of noise going on there, but most basically we have a disjunction of a conjunction and a conditional. Then we have two conjunctions. The first conjunction has the conjunction which is in this disjunction as its antecedent. The second one has the conditional that's in that disjunction as its antecedent. From that we infer a disjunction of the consequence of the two conditionals, that is constructive dilemma C. 
CD. Question 8. We've got a negated biconditional and we've got a conditional. From that, we infer a conjunction of those two sentences. So that's conjunction again, the abbreviation conj. In the ninth question, we've got a negated conjunction, then we've got a conditional with a disjunction for the antecedent, a conjunction for the consequent, and from that we infer the negation of the antecedent. The important thing to notice is that the first sentence is the negation of the consequent. Very important, these aren't in the order that they come in the template, but order above the line isn't the important thing. The important thing is we have all two necessary items of information, namely a conditional and the consequent of that conditional with the tilde in front of it. That allows us to validly infer the antecedent of the conditional with the tilde in front of it. That's modus tollens abbreviation MT. We move on to question 10. We've got a conditional, a disjunction, another conditional. From that we infer a disjunction. Very important to notice that the disjunction is a disjunction of the two concept, or sorry, the two antecedents of the conditionals. The disjunction is a disjunction of the two antecedents of the conditionals, and the inferred sentence is a disjunction of the two consequents. So, not in the same order as the template, but that's not the important thing. The important thing is that we've got all three items of information related in the appropriate way, that we've satisfied the requirements for employing Constructive Dilemma, CD. So, in logic, close doesn't count. You have to have exactly the information specified in the template. Of course, there's a range of different concrete instances of information that exactly specifies the form or underlying logical structure specified in the template. You don't need to have the stuff above the line in the exact order in which it occurs in the template. Question 11, we've got three rather complicated looking conditionals. The key thing to notice, the antecedent of the top conditional and the consequent of the bottom conditional are identical. Again, in the opposite order of the way it is in the template, but that's not significant. What's significant is that we have the two conditionals that are related in that way. So that is, I didn't leave myself quite enough room. Hypothetical Syllogism HS. We move on to question 12. Again, in the opposite order from what's specified in the template, but that's not the important thing. The important thing is we have in the second line a disjunction, in the first line the negation of one of the disjuncts, itself a smaller disjunction, that entitles us to validly infer the other disjunct. Disjunctive syllogism this time. 
DS. Finally, we've got a biconditional, and then we've got a somewhat complicated conditional. The important thing, though, is that the antecedent of that conditional is identical to the sentence we have on the top line. That's just an example of good old modus ponens. The abbreviation is NP. So there we have it. We've got 26 out of 26. We're moving along. On the test, there will be, again, I haven't actually made it, but there will either be 10 or 12 questions like this, and I'll have it set up so that there, there are nice, neat boxes to the side in which you can put the name of the rule and the abbreviation. The, uh, so each of those questions will be worth two marks each, one for the name of the rule, one for the abbreviation. So this will end our consideration of the eight basic rules for now, we'll begin learning how to actually strategically employ these eight basic rules after the first exam. At this point, though, you need to know the patterns for the eight basic rules well enough that you can recognize which pattern is evident in various examples of actual situations in the language SL. So remember those basic rule templates are using the lowercase variables which refers to a whole range of different possible configurations. The important thing is that the configuration in the language SL has an identical form or underlying logical structure to the one specified in the template. <clears throat> we finally arrived at the final segment of our video lecture series before test one. In this segment I'm going to complete a few of the questions from assignment four, namely questions one, five, and nine. <clears throat> I'm also, after that, going to complete questions 19 and 20, which are in the top left-hand corner. Those two questions are just single sentences, although rather complex ones. Those are from the previous exercise, and I don't give the solutions to those two questions in the solutions I'm going to be posting on the class homepage. So I'll give those solutions here. Let's start with argument one in section five, symbolization of arguments in propositional logic. So, Rather than writing out full sentences, this author just gives us three capital letters after the argument, R, E, and C. Hopefully by this time, though, you're familiar enough with this process of converting arguments in English into this symbolic notation that this extra step won't be that difficult. Capital R, then, is going to stand for the simple sentence, time is relative. Capital E for the simple sentence, the universe is expanding. And capital C for the simple sentence, the universe is contracting or beginning to contract. Notice there are a number of additional stylistic elements in here that can be edited out. The first sentence. If time is relative, comma, then if the universe is expanding, comma, 
then eventually it must begin to contract again. What we have there are two conditional indicators, two separate ifs, accompanied by a then for each of them, which is purely stylistic. The commas, though, play a very important logical structuring role here. So, the sentence starts off, if time is relative, then if the universe is expanding, then it will contract again. The punctuation tells us that this entire sentence is a conditional where the consequent of that main conditional is a smaller conditional. The second sentence, but, here, and this happens, that word but isn't a conjunction indicator, it's merely a contrast indicator. In a sense, it joins the first sentence to the second sentence, but since they're being treated as separate sentences, we'll keep them that way in formulating the argument rather than making a big long conjunction. This can only occur if time is not relative. What's this? The universe contracting again. So that's C. One other thing to note and I should point out here, I'm not the one that made up the English language. As logicians, we just have to deal with arguments as they occur in English. Things would be a little bit easier for us if the second sentence said, but this, the universe contracting again, can occur only if time is not relative. So, the key logical indicator phrase there is the two-word only if. Notice, though, with the English wording, but this can only occur if time is not relative. For non-logical, stylistic reasons, English speakers have adopted the convention of occasionally splitting only ifs up and inserting one or more words between the only and an if and the if. We can't really criticize English speakers for doing that, claiming they're making life logically difficult. Rather, we just have to be aware of it so that we can accurately construct the symbolization that represents the form or underlying logical structure. That being said, but this, the universe contracting again, can only occur if time is not relative. That's just C, horseshoe, and since it says time is not relative, we add the tilde in front of the R. Therefore, that's the conclusion indicator which separates the two provers from the conclusion Time is not relative. So there's a sketch of the form or underlying logical structure of the first argument. After the first exam, we are then going to consider ways to analyze these underlying logical structures in order to distinguish the valid or logically flawed ones from the, or sorry, the valid or logically flawless ones from the invalid or logically flawed ones. Let's now go forward to question five. If, and then we have a comma, if Socrates criticizes Plato, then Plato criticizes Aristotle, then disagreement prevails in the ancient Greek academy. This is a particularly difficult wording. Linguists have considered this. The human mind doesn't like it when we stack 
the word if on top of each other like that. What this sentence is saying is if, so what comes immediately after the if is the antecedent of a conditional, and what comes immediately after the if is the following phrase that occurs between the two commas. If Socrates criticizes Plato, then Plato criticizes Aristotle. If you look to the top of the next page, capital S is going to stand for Socrates criticizes Plato, capital P is going to stand for Plato criticizes Aristotle. So, if If Socrates criticizes Plato, then Plato criticizes Aristotle. So what's being indicated there is if a certain conditional, if Socrates criticizes Plato, then Plato criticizes Aristotle, is going to be the antecedent of a larger conditional. So let's start from the beginning again. If if Socrates criticizes Plato, then Plato criticizes Aristotle, then disagreement prevails in the ancient Greek academy, which is just the simple sentence D. So instead of having a situation like this, where we've got a conditional with a smaller conditional as the consequent, we've got a conditional with a smaller conditional as the antecedent. Second sentence, if Theophrastus defends Aristotle, so that's going to be T, then if Plato does not criticize Aristotle, then Aristotle defends Socrates. So, Plato criticizes Aristotle is going to be P. Plato does not criticize Aristotle is going to be tilde P. So in this second sentence, we've got if Theophrastus defends Aristotle, so that's T, if that, then, and notice we've got a comma then clearly indicating this, if Plato does not criticize Aristotle, so this time it's going to be tilde P coming immediately after the if, then Aristotle defends Socrates. So that's the new sentence. So we've got two somewhat complex conditionals one after the other. Hence, there's our conclusion indicator. The inescapable and highly paradoxical conclusion, all of that is just rhetoric, stylistic wordage, no logical significance, that hence the inescapable and highly paradoxical conclusion, that whole phrase we can say is a long-worded, long-winded conclusion indicator that if disagreement prevails in the ancient Greek academy or Aristotle defends Socrates, so that's if D or A, then in case Theophrastus defends Aristotle, disagreement prevails in the ancient Greek academy. That's an odd wording, I would say, in case. It's just a conclusion indicator. It's really the equivalent of the word if. You might want to look on page 3 where various English phrases are given as ways of indicating logical relations. Then, in case Theophrastus defends Aristotle, disagreement prevails in the ancient Greek community, which is just T. 
T horseshoe D. Somewhat tricky conditionals for the two premises as well as the conclusion. One last thing to emphasize one more time. These kind of things will probably strike you as more difficult than they really are the less familiar you are with this process of symbolization. Another way of putting it, the more you do it, the longer you work at it, the more natural and easier these kinds of symbolizations become. You never know what the ways in which certain people might word arguments so you have to be fully conversant in being able to effectively and accurately symbolize the form or underlying logical structure of the arguments they present. That being said, let's proceed to argument 9. The dinosaurs are extinct, that's D, but not their descendants among certain birds and reptiles. So, is that E or D? I always forget this. It's D. So, the dinosaurs are extinct, but, remember, that's a conjunctive indicator. It's also indicating contrast. The dinosaurs are distinct, but not their descendants amongst birds and reptiles. Once the dinosaurs became in extinct, sorry, there was no dominant life form on Earth unless you count the newly emerging mammals. So capital L is going to stand for there was or is a dominant life form on Earth. M is going to stand for mammals are. So how do we symbolize that? Notice the unless in the very last clause. Unless you count the newly emerging mammals. In other words, We'll put a tilde in front of that and make that an antecedent of a conditional. If you don't count the newly emerging mammals, then once the dinosaurs became extinct, there was no dominant life form. Here again, it's a little bit of a tricky conditional indicator. If the dinosaurs became extinct, which they did, then there's no dominant life form on Earth. Third sentence. If you don't consider the newly emerging mammals as the dominant life form on Earth at the time, so that's just a long-winded way of indicating M, and we've got the if, so it's another example of tilde M being the antecedent of a conditional, What's the consequent of this second conditional? Then, there was no dominant life form just in case. Here, if you look on page 3, the three-word phrase, just in case, is reasonably common in philosophy writings, but I don't think you ever see it outside of philosophy. So, in case is a conditional indicator, just in case is a biconditional indicator. Just in case, either the descendants of dinosaurs amongst certain reptiles or birds are extinct. So that's reptiles or birds. Here, there's no requirement this way, but generally speaking, I like to alternate the brackets. The only 
What's a, the only thing that's indicated by that is it enables us to do, tell which brackets go with which more quickly and easily. Therefore, our conclusion indicator, you must count the newly emerging mammals at the time of the extinction of dinosaurs as the dominant life form on Earth. So, that's just the simple conclusion. M. Mammals were the dominant life form on Earth. So there we have the underlying logical structures of three arguments. Now we can turn to the two sentences at the top left-hand corner of the page. The first one, some people are better at math than others, and if some people are better at math than others, then they find it easy to solve math problems. Semicolon followed by the word but, some people are better at math than others, and no one finds it easy to solve math problems, comma, only if it is not the case that some people are better at math than others. First thing to do, recall, determine the main connective. The main connective is, of course, determined by the semicolon, but. So what we've got here, then, is a somewhat complicated conjunction. By determining the main connective, we've now split the single complicated task into two smaller tasks that are half as complicated. Let's begin now with the sentence which is the left conjunct of the conjunction. Some people are better at math than others, and if some people are better at math than others, then they find it easy to solve math problems. Notice there's a comma after the sentence some people are better at math than others, and before the word and. That tells us that we've got the simple sentence B, and the part after the word and is the second conjunct of a conjunction. And that second conjunct says, if some people are better at math than others, then they find it easy to solve math problems, which is B horseshoe E. Now we can move to the right conjunct. Some people are better at math than others, and no one finds it easy to solve math problems, comma, only if it is not the case that some people are better at math than others. So, we've got an and, and we've also got an only if with a comma occurring right before it. So that tells us that everything before the comma is the antecedent of a conditional, and everything after the only if is the consequent of a conditional. So, we can put a conditional indicator in the middle of the second square. It's not the case that some people are better at math than others. It's just tilde B. And the part before the only if, some people are better at math than others, and no one finds it easy to solve math problems, which is just B and tilde E. Ooh. So we're perhaps a little bit squished there. B and Tilde E, horseshoe, T, 
killed a bee. So there we have it, somewhat of a complicated conditional, but we can accurately symbolize it and make it as easy as possible on ourselves by per proceeding strategically, find the main connective, and then if either of the two parts is still complicated, find the main connective of the smaller part. On to question 20. Unless someone finds a way to the summit, we will not be able to cross the glacier or set up base camp below the mountain until nightfall. Semicolon and. If we are to observe the precautions we were given, then we must reconnoiter. What does that mean? Run a reconnaissance mission. Scope out the area. Find out what the physical terrain is like. We must reconnoiter another entrance to the valley pass tomorrow. That is to say, we've got to go inspect the area, find another way of getting there, or else turn back and try again next season. So once again, we've got a big long conjunction, this time indicated by a semicolon and. So we divide the whole big sentence into two conjuncts. The part before the semicolon and says, unless someone finds a way to the summit, we will not be able to cross the glacier or set up base camp below the mountain until nightfall. So we've got the word unless, then we've got a comma, then we've got the word not and the word or. Capital S then will, will stand for the simple sentence, someone finds a way to the summit, or someone is able to find a way to the summit. Those two sentences would indicate one and the same proposition about how the world is. Capital G will stand for, we will be able to cross the glacier, or we did cross the glacier, something like that. G, or sorry, C will stand for we will be able to set up base camp below the mountain until nightfall. So, the, um, what comes immediately after the unless is someone finds a way to the summit. So we put a tilde in front of that, make it the antecedent of a conditional. The consequent of the conditional, this conditional, is we will not be able to cross the glacier or set up base camp below the mountain until nightfall. So that's tilde G or C. Now we can move to the second conjunct. If we are to observe the precautions we were given, then we must reconnoiter another entrance to the valley pass tomorrow or else turn back or try again next season. Here we've got a combination of punctuation and wording which tells us that the whole second conjunct is a conditional and the antecedent of the conditional is Whatever comes immediately after the if up to the comma, we are to observe the precautions we were given, or we do observe the precautions we were given. So that's just P. If P, then um, we must reconnoiter another entrance to the Valley Pass tomorrow. So that's R or turn back and try again next season. Then we just need one more set of brackets to indicate that that disjunction is the consequent of this conditional, which is the second conjunct, in the whole conjunction. So there we have it. Symbolization, the more symbolization questions you do, the easier, the more natural it will become. So there's plenty of 
symbolization questions for you to work on. My recommendation, start with the easiest ones and strategically work towards the harder ones. Remember when I wrote up in the um, rightmost blackboard, do the questions in assignment one, then do the questions in assignment two, part one, then do the questions in assignment three, then do the questions in assignment two, part two, and finally do the questions in assignment four.